This channel's got a bit of a reputation for being Doomer, which means I'm always foreseeing doom and terror in the future. Honestly, that's entirely fair when I put out videos like this. However, it's not an entirely accurate view of what I think the future is going to be like. Yes, I think some bad stuff's going to go down pretty soon since the world system's fundamentally broken, but I think everyone's going to end the 21st century significantly better off than how they started. I think advances and improvements will be so great that in your old age, you'll look back upon your youth and wonder how you got by. Every century has been dominated by a couple major trends that you could predict most of the important events that occurred in that century by following a logic train starting from that trajectory. This is a video that exists to tease out what I think the four dominant trends of the 21st century are going to be. We'll make out a longer term, more optimistic view of the world in 2100 than I normally would have. We live in a world where technology is changing the workforce a tremendous amount, and so to stay on top of things is probably the best to learn skills that might end up being your career. With Skillshare, you can learn all sorts of new skills. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative people where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes in stuff like graphic design, photography, creative writing, animation, marketing, and web development. I really found their course by Anthony Pisa about five exercises to unlock creative identity really fascinating since as a YouTuber I have to be creative all the time and work with my brand. It talks about how building a style is really a process of world building and constructing a list of common tropes that your audience can relate back to. Skillshare provides classes that include a combination of video lessons and a class project that can fit your schedule and skill level. Skillshare is designed to help you learn. There are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes so you can explore something new and focus on building skills that will last a lifetime. No matter who you are, you can benefit by visiting Skillshare and finding something that interests you. Right now, Skillshare is offering the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description below a one-month free trial. Download Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity now. I know these trends actually exist since we've seen their predictive ability looking backwards across history. Most predictions of the future go horribly wrong. This is since people take a trend that's occurred over the last generation or often most of their lives without understanding what's causing it and just have it go for another generation just harder and faster. The truth is that that almost never happens. For example, you got predictions of cannibalism and complete global overpopulation coming from the 1970s, since that generation beforehand had seen the fastest population growth ever up to that point in history. These predictions failed by missing two things, the first of which was the Green Revolution, which turned out to be one of the most important events in history. The world's population more than doubled from 1970 to the present, but everyone turned out to be better fed, and global forest lands actually expanded by more than 15% since the 1990s. This was since agricultural productivity went up by a massive margin. The second thing was that wealthier countries have less kids, and because of that, as the world got wealthier, there were less kids total, so the population problem ended up solving itself in the long term. And now, we're going to actually see global population decline over the next couple decades. The predictions that do work, and we'll reference a couple of these across the video, were those that correctly teased out a long-term trend, as in one lasting in centuries rather than a single generation, and understood its broader significance across the whole of society. An easy example of this from the 20th century was John Brunner, a sci-fi writer from the 1960s who wrote about a 2010s America run by its first black president, named Abomi, in which the Soviet Union had collapsed and was replaced by China as America's main rival in a new Cold War. At the same time, homosexuality has been normalized and gay marriage legalized. Random acts of violence like school shootings take place, people use video conferences and headphones, prices have risen sixfold since the 1960s, as inflation's gotten way worse, a wave of terrorism takes place, short-term hookups often replace marriage and long-term relationships, marginalization of tobacco while marijuana's been legalized in a lot of spots, rising real estate prices, and a global population of 8 billion. If you couldn't tell, all of that really happened. With all of that going on, we could start with the assumption that John Brunner's a time traveler, which... Honestly, I'd consider reasonable, but realistically, he teased out two trends across the 20th century really well, and I don't even know if he did this on a conscious level, but those two trends were population growth, which increases competition, 
and decline in traditional religion. If you want more explanation, here's a video I made talking about this. The predictive trends of the 20th century were, number one, the spread of the Industrial Revolution and thus political power away from Britain and France to other larger regions in the West. Number two, the decline in traditional religions and their replacement by humanist philosophies like liberalism, communism, fascism, etc. Three, waves of population growth starting the century in the wealthiest countries and ending in the poorest. And four, total war subsuming larger nations into mega-empires, and finally reaching mutually assured destruction. You could have predicted the events in the 20th century from these points. In this video, just as I have four points of the 20th century, I've tried my best and I have four guesses for what I think the long-term trajectories of the 21st century are going to be. They're probably not what you think, and I'm intrigued to see what your collective reactions in the comments are. Before we start, I have said this before and I'm going to say it again. My job here is basically betting against God, and so the chances of this actually turning out correctly are pretty low. But this is my honest attempt, and let's see what happens, and let's work from there. Number one, greater wealth. Much as people in the first world often like to flagellate themselves at oppressing the third world and starving children in Africa, things are going pretty well in the third world. The last 40 years have been the era of the greatest economic growth ever in world history. Nearly 2 billion people, mostly in Asia, but also in Eastern Europe and Latin America, have been lifted out of poverty since the end of the Cold War. If you want evidence that communism works worse than capitalism, here it is, screaming at you. You see loads of this in China. Look at the city of Shenzhen, for example. It was a fishing village 30 years ago, and now it's this. Similarly, this whole side of the river in Shanghai was literally a field 40 years ago. There are 800 million hungry people in the world and 2 billion obese, many of them in the third world. The only places where people legitimately starve are those in countries where their governments want them to for political reasons, like Yemen or South Sudan. It's so nice to go to a place like Mexico and see lots of obese people where a generation or so ago you'd see far more thin. I do think the third world will see a massive crisis in the decades to come, mostly due to a combination of globalization and their political and social structures not being able to maintain the massive population and economic growth they've seen in the past few decades. Sort of like why World War I happened in Europe, but I don't think that'll be able to hold them back for the whole century. The sources of greater wealth being capitalism and technological progress are both stable. Everyone serious has realized that capitalism is the best economic system and anyone who hasn't will be crushed by those who have. Also, the technological revolutions that are almost certainly about to happen in things like manufacturing ability, biotech, which is immense potential of agriculture and disease, and green energy will benefit the third world. I once read a prediction saying that the average Bangladeshi at the end of the century will be as wealthy as the average Dutchman today, and I don't know if that's true, but it's definitely within the realm of possibility. These events will also be pronounced in the first world, where advances in productivity and technology will probably result in your descendants living lives like those of the pre-industrial aristocracy. People will work far less hours and will spend the rest of the time on war, sport, art, politics, or working more hours to get more money. Remember, the first world countries are democracies, and in the US's case, a very well-armed one, and so dystopian systems in which a tiny elite controls the factories and gives welfare scraps to the population politically won't work out because of either revolution or voting out the government. As people become wealthier and the cost of bottom tier goods collapses due to automation, people being the status seeking creatures they are, will buy luxury goods which will become a larger and larger percentage of the economy. People will take pride in buying handcrafted artisanal goods to show that they're not poor, goods which they'll source via the gig economy. Wealthy populations tend to have less kids and the world's population will stabilize. We're actually seeing this happen in real time with global population collapsing faster than anyone saw coming. India, or a poor country's birth rate today, is 2.2, or where America's was in the 1970s, and their birth rate's collapsing faster than America's ever did. A lot of the demographic trends we see in the future are literal black holes that just can't be solved. For countries like Germany, Italy, China, and Japan, their population structures have so few young people that they actually can't be turned around, and they'll leave this century with around half the population they have now. Likewise, the social collapse of a country like China will precipitate a political crisis such as a war that will result in possibly lowering a lot of their neighbors' populations as well. In short, I think the world's population might stabilize at the end of this century billions of people lower than it is today. Something we forget is that population in the pre-industrial world was generally pretty stable for thousands of years. 
Egypt had the same population when Napoleon arrived as it did around the birth of Christ, and England in the 15th century's population wasn't that much higher than it was during the Iron Age. You should view the last 200 years as a bizarre formation of an industrial world which involved massive population growth that will eventually stabilize. Having the world's population stabilize will change so many things that we just assume are normal. Currency will be stable or deflationary, as is always the case in eras of population stability. Similarly, the only driver of economic growth will be technological progress. Wars without people really having immense skin in the game since no one's going to starve will be fought less brutally in more controlled ceremonial fashion. Number 2. The Clash of Civilizations People often talk about China dominating the next century or this being the Asian century. I don't believe this. First of all, it presumes China continues its meteoric economic growth that it's had over the next 40 years, which I don't think it will do due to China's massive demographic, social, and political problems that largely go unsaid since the Chinese government doesn't want to talk about them. Similarly, it presumes the decline of America, which really has no evidence to back it. Considering America has remained a stable quarter of the world's economy since the 1960s and America's continued cultural and technological predominance. I think the best model for politics in the 21st century comes from Sam Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, a book written in the 1990s that said that the world after the Cold War would be dominated by the conflict between different civilizations. He was laughed at at the time, but he was actually able to accurately predict China becoming America's main rival, Islamic terrorism against the West, the Iranians and North Koreans pushing for a nuclear bomb, India becoming an American ally, and Western countries closing off immigration. Turns out, although people consciously don't think it, the world is becoming more and more dominated by the struggles between civilizations. I find a couple things compelling in the Clash of Civilizations model. The first of which is that it doesn't presuppose a single country will rule the world, which, considering how wealth in the Industrial Revolution is spreading, seems unlikely. It was easy for Britain to have a massive world empire when only northwestern Europe and northeastern North America were industrialized. However, in a world in which Indonesia has a larger economy than Germany, that's just not possible. Lots of the assumptions of the modern world are built off the superiority of the West that could no longer be assumed. Marxism, liberalism, and fascism, for example, were all formed in roughly northwestern Europe. It'll be intriguing to figure out what the philosophies educated Indians or Chinese will form, pulling on their own extremely rich intellectual traditions. The geography of Asia, which is split and divided by massive deserts, jungles, grasslands, and the like, predisposes the continent towards division, not unity. There should be an Indian, Islamic, and East Asian bloc rather than a single big empire. Once those blocs gain confidence, they'll pull on their historic roots to form their identities. We're already seeing this to a large degree, with Turkey going to Neo-Ottoman, India as Hindu nationalist, and China hearkening back to their dynasties. Similarly, having different politically divided civilizations that work together as a civilization has been the norm across history. Look at jihads and crusades or how the greater India has spread across Asia. The world will in a lot of ways return to the Middle Ages, in which there will be a Western, Far Eastern, Islamic, and Indian bloc, possibly with large empires as their cornerstone states like the US, China, India, or the Turkish Caliphate. America facing broadly civilizational threats will double down in its Western identity, becoming aggressively liberal, and as we'll talk about in the next few trends, possibly having a new reformation. I wonder about Europe, however, who seems to have had its spirit broken by the world wars and has little desire to take pride in its native identity, unlike the Asian countries. My guess is that Europe's pulled into a Western sphere kicking and screaming by the Americans, and Europe adopts a more revived, Americanized Western culture. Number three. Humanity gains the power of gods and realizes that they don't want it. The 21st century is going to give us many godlike capabilities. I mean this in the sense of power equaling that of the ancient Greek gods. In some ways, we already have it with stuff like flying and immediate communication via cell phones. However, we'll likely gain the ability to create life, mess with the human brain, extend our lifetimes, and colonize space. However, the problem we're going to reach is that we'll have to filter between the technologies we actually want to bring into the world and will improve the condition of the human race, and those that won't, and we should taboo or show no interest in. I'm not a technologist, I'm a historian, but I talk to a lot of technologists, and it's always interesting to see them go on about some new technology, to which my reaction is, that sounds entirely useless, but they seem to take great interest in it for being new. Take Neuralink, which people in tech continually say is a game-changer technology that supposedly lets people mentally communicate between their brains and software. However, all the modern science with Neuralink suggests that it only works for medical patients like schizoids or to control limbs and can't read thoughts. Any attempt to do so ends up destroying and hurting the brain. Similarly, take AI, which is a massive cult community behind it. 
However, from everything I've read, AI can be very good at single tasks, but it will never be able to make decisions in the real world, which is just too complicated. AI's actual practical application in the world besides for single tasks is close to nothing. After years of digging, I've basically found the desire for AI comes from a nerd wish that we could develop something more logical than human thinking, but truth be told, you don't want logical thinking for decisions. You want someone who's capable of weighing emotionally everyone they love and how much they care about minor trade-offs. Those are only things you know. We've been trying to push for technology to solve our problems almost as a push against realizing that things that make us happy were the things that we've had the whole time, like friends, good food, nature, being a good person, and family. And of course technology has changed the game in some key ways. Fighting a war with tanks is different than that with chariots. And at the same time it has made people happier, where having your son not die of malaria makes your life generally happier. Yes, technology will improve our lives immensely over the next century, but once we're living like nobility and have the ability to genetically engineer demons, what drive will we have to really have more technological progress across the whole board? It wouldn't surprise me if we reach a technological equilibrium for industrial civilization similar to that agricultural societies had, and that the life of a peasant in the Neolithic wasn't that different in basic work as that of a 19th century French peasant. Humans are going to have to draw lines about what technology they want to approach and which ones they don't, sort of like how we've learned to be very careful with nuclear weapons and poison gas. Take space travel and colonization, which will probably be widely considered to be a universal good on the other side, since no one gets hurt and involves spreading human life. We'll probably taboo the creation or editing of life, human genetic engineering, and the search for immortality. Both of these things have been marked as divine hubris and myths from cultures around the world, which eternally contain more wisdom than we'd like to believe, since they would generally involve more wisdom on humans' part than we really have. Whenever humans try to change a region's ecosystem, it horrifically backfires, and almost all social engineering programs also fail terribly. This is why totalitarianism almost always burns out quickly, in that no one's smart enough to control an entire society from above. The rebuttal to this is why don't we engineer ourselves to be smarter to be able to make these decisions, which is missing the main point that we don't know enough about the brain to do that and probably never will. We're going to have to realize that there are technologies that we can use, but we're not wise enough to use responsibly. These will become taboo. Any country that works on them will be crushed by the other members of the balance of power. The world will descend into the quiet of a new ancien regime. We've already seen and will continue to see this in war, and that makes sense given that military technology tends to be ahead of civilian. We realize the total war wasn't worth it with nuclear weapons, and we'll have a series of smaller revelations with things like genetic engineering, life extension, and the like. However, as an example, mutually assured destruction won't mean the end of war. War is necessary to reset political realities, but it does mean the end of total war. War in the future will be much more limited with smaller objectives like it has been for most of human history. Once people are richer and realize they're still not happy, religion will take a new role and importance in society as a guide to a better, happier life. People will focus on community, art, and the like. We'll probably eventually realize the thing that would make us the happiest would be a return to a more primitive lifestyle like that our ancestors lived. In intimate small communities, not being sexually repressed, working less, with nature around us, and ceremonies and rituals to mark the passing of our lives. Number 4. Populism and the Internet History has been divided between centralized and decentralized ages. For a comparison, this is a map of Europe in the year 100 AD, and this is a map of 1300. In the first era, giant armies were the main way power was held together, while in the second, power was held by lords and tiny castles that divided up the land. The 20th century, an era with massive European colonial empires, in which eventually resulted in a world with two, and then one superpowers, was the ultimate era of centralized empires. At the end of the century, for the first and probably only time in history, power was centralized in a single world superpower of the United States. However, at the same time, the defeats of European and French forces in Vietnam and Algeria, followed by the rise of international terrorism, created a world in which the nation-state and the hyperpower was far weaker. Now we're in a world in which second-rate powers like France and Turkey are competing over Libya without the US really caring. Are we in the 17th century for Christ's sake? The world since 1500 has been that of the gunpowder revolution, in which, due to the cheap cost of guns, Big armies mattered, and so the countries which mobilized the biggest armies won. This was a process that resulted in the world wars and the US becoming the sole world power. However, due to mutually assured destruction, total war is no longer feasible. With perhaps one horrifying exception to shake us into making this true, the future won't be waged in total wars, but more limited ones. This weakens the power of broad, centralized governments. 
Similarly, the internet allows large amounts of communication without governments, which was far more difficult before. Digital communities can form outside of the nation. The reason, for example, I'm so confident an Islamic caliphate will form is that so many Muslims on the internet want it and would be willing to coordinate it. The effects of the internet will be massively positive. In real terms, the whole purpose of the modern world has been to transform people into cogs in some broader planner's scheme, destroying everything else that differentiates someone or some region. Don't believe me? The left following the interests of a bureaucratic government pushes against nationality, dominant ethnic groups, femininity in women, masculinity in men, the military, police, family values, religion, and anything that would prevent a left-wing bureaucrat from making broad social changes over millions. The right, normally representing business interests, pushes against the environment, unions, and local customs and ways of life. You can view the modern international order as built by corporations and governments that push for size and efficiency and in exchange crush individual identity. Large corporations work with governments to have regulations to weaken smaller competition, regulate every aspect of life between child-rearing, leisure, or business, and have a single encompassing worldview, that of Reaganite capitalism combined with social justice exported around the world. This is why you can travel around the world and go to cities that look exactly the same and where people have the same ideas. The internet allows people to organize independently of these large organizations in a more democratic and populist way. In America, both right and left have been torn up by political movements driven by the internet. We don't need big corporations as much when the gig economy allows people to be connected with each other independently. With Zoom, people can move to the countryside and work remotely, thus deprioritizing larger cities. People can organize into intimate communities of like-minded people, and the internet by democratizing communication will democratize society and allow more local power. Democratizing life will make it more crude, especially by our modern standards. If the internet's the main form of communication, people will care less about spelling or punctuation, for example. In a society where everyone's watched internet porn from a young age, it would end up being socially acceptable and probably even educational material on how to be good at sex. There is this whole school of cryptocurrency thought called the sovereign individual, which talks about this whole process and takes it to the extreme that centralized governments won't exist anymore, which I don't believe. Governments like the U.S. that can exert real military power and have a national identity will continue to exist without problem. However, for countries like Cameroon or Bolivia that don't really have either of those, I'm not that sure. The internet will allow some countries like China to be more repressive in the short term due to better technology, but such regimes collapse in the long term while competing with free countries since they run against human nature. A tyrannical communist China would collapse similarly to how Chinese tyrannies have collapsed before. The main intellectual force of the world over the last 500 years has been the university. Universities have been where ideas, inventions, and in the last two decades, the leadership class have come out of. However, universities have been corrupt due to this monopoly, charging exorbitant fees, pushing their own ideology above the truth, and not encouraging genius or breakthroughs. However, the internet has broken the university's grip on knowledge. Take this channel, in which I, a 20-year-old college dropout with no credentials whatsoever, have an audience approaching a million a month, more than almost any professor. Religions appeal to the masses and philosophies to administrators. Eras of strong centralized governments like the Roman or Chinese empires were those of philosophies like Stoicism, Epicureanism, Confucianism, or Legalism. While those of weak centralized governments like the Middle Ages or most of Indian history had Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism. The administrators like to fool themselves that philosophies are smarter since they're more logical, but realistically Christianity is a far more useful guide to human nature than communism or Epicureanism ever could be. The fact that Christianity has held up multiple civilizations for 2,000 years, while every humanist ideology we've mustered in the last few centuries collapses after a few decades should be indicative of this. I'm mostly a history guy, but I read all the social sciences and it's very interesting when you see that one field of the social sciences doesn't read another. Economists never read enough history for their own good, in my opinion. However, it's really interesting to see that theology always gets ignored since religion isn't cool. It's funny to see profound truths get written in theology and then be totally ignored by the rest of society. I'm surprised people haven't realized that there really isn't a contradiction between science and religion. Science has no idea why the Big Bang happened, why there's a force of chaos or order or division and unity that operates across the whole universe's history. In both physics and psychology, you hit a black wall of mystery, whether with the unconscious, dark matter, string theory, or the like. You know who's been saying that for thousands of years? Religion. 
Most of the things people find objectionable in traditional religions like abortion or attitudes towards sex and nudity are never or barely mentioned in the Bible but are later additions. The God of the New Testament doesn't care if you like sex. It's also interesting to see social sciences like anthropology and psychology come along to the principles of traditional religion like not lying, helping the poor, marrying and the like are supported by science. Jordan Peterson's the easiest example of this. Religion is the why things happen and science is the how. The 21st century will have more power than humans have ever had before, and we'll start to ask why. The 21st century will be a populist and religious one. What a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out my Instagram, Twitter, or my Patreon, where I've got the first couple hundred pages written of my cultural history of America and history of the world. As always, thanks so much for watching, and have a great day.